Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this uh, is another episode of the three consulting amigos. We've been through three of the elements of the Baldridge, leadership, strategy, and customers. And today, um, our CPA and our numbers guy, uh, Ed, is going to take us through measurement, which is really important. You know, you can't, if you can't measure something, you can't manage it. And then following that, we'll go through workforce, operations, and then the final culmin culminating thing in the Baldridge is the results, you know, how all this comes together in such a way that enables you to see where your organization is going. So um, as you can see here, I'm going to put up on the screen measurement analysis and knowledge management. And Ed, I'm going to let you uh, take it away and give us uh, some insights as to how, you know, this can make your company more effective. Well, it's a uh, very powerful category. Like you said, you really can't progress unless you have an ability to measure results. I think a lot of people fall short on that. They rely upon simple income statement for doing so. But as we know, there's a lot more metrics that should be shared with the team to determine how well you're doing. I think a now, if you, measurement is weak in most companies, but I really believe anal, uh, to analyze data is even weaker. Um, and that's where you can really come across some great observations. Um, about the business, whether you're moving forward in a positive manner or not. And um, some people are better at analysis than others. And uh, Ron and I were just involved with a situation where uh, we were analyzing um, some downturns in the market on the revenue side and um, picked up on it way before we heard feedback from customers. That's how powerful analysis can be. So that's extremely important. And then knowledge management. Uh, no matter what you do, your, your management team has to be knowledgeable on how to do their jobs so you can accomplish their objectives. I, I have a little difficulty with Baldrige at times because they're so simplistic in their questions. And these areas are much more complicated and complex than that. So I will start by going through the um, questions here. I think there's five questions all together. And the first one is, I, I know how to measure the quality of my work when I'm doing my job for my company. And uh, I'm not sure everybody knows that, but uh, obviously it kind of starts with the individual doing the job. But I really have uh, some difficulty understanding um, or for people to understand how they do and how they can improve it to make their company more effective. I, that's where I think they need a lot of help and they need some help from the outside to make that transition. I was in, I was in management for so long. And as, of course, we all thought we did everything perfectly. And, um, you know, we took a lot of pride in that, but you don't know what you don't know. And that's, and that's the real risk. And if you are able to look at things differently, you can see opportunities for making improvements. And I always like to go back to the, uh, the old phrase of digging the ditch. Every day you come into work, you dig the ditch, and then you go home. Well, you've got to figure out a way, a better way to dig that ditch, because uh, that's where the real value is. And um, it, it's more exciting work, actually, to figure out how to do something differently, more effectively, more efficiently. Uh, than just coming in and doing the work and going home. Yeah, and that ditch that ditch needs to include the uh, the data digging ditch as well. That you know that ditch has got to include the data part. Yeah, you gotta you gotta be able to analyze it and and um, be able to improve it. And, and I I think a lot of people will say, yeah, I, I I I know how to measure the quality of my work. Yeah, yes, that's a that's a strong yes. Uh, yeah, I know how this information can make information. Uh, uh, can change the way uh, I do my job and make it more productive because I'm doing a very good job right now. How can I get any better? And I think <laughs> I think that's kind of where you end up with those first two questions. And um, the next one is really a tough transition is to know how what I do in particular and how does it fit the goals and objectives of the overall organization or overall organization. The measurement of the overall organization, the PL, how do I fit into that PL? Or what line item do I uh, represent? And do I understand how what I do, how it impacts those numbers? 
Um, I don't think that's possible in a lot of situations. I don't think a lot of times people don't even are they don't even share information with people on the front line who's doing the uh, doing their work. So uh, I think that's a disconnect at that point. And um, do I get all the information to do my work? Probably they don't. Um, some some companies are so tight lipped they're very um, very um, concerned about giving out too much information. And I think by doing so, you you inhibit the productivity of your operation by doing so. People got to know how they fit in and they have to have all the available information, analytics, et cetera, so they can do their jobs properly. And um, do they know how their organization is doing as a whole? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I doubt if they really do get that information. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably only at the top of the organization. But I really believe it needs to be shared throughout the organization so that people understand how well they're doing. So I kind of set the stage. I'm kind of looking forward to your guys' uh, comments on this. Well, I, I certainly agree with your assessment that sometimes this is simplistic. This is really measuring communications. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, I, I, and Ray, you can, you can speak to this a little bit better, but um, if you discover through this that the manager, the, the owner thinks that, um, the quality is set and that he gives everything to everybody to get their job done. And then somebody else comes along and says, well, no, I, I don't really think I know how to measure the quality of my work. Then, you know, that might be considered, well, that's a, uh, that's a communication problem. We've got to be sure to uh, let our people know how to do this. But then on the other hand, I guess, uh, to your point, Ed, the question might really be, what is the standard of quality that we're looking for? It's easy in manufacturing to um, uh, say, well, we've got to have certain tolerances on this and this and this, and the customers expected this and so forth. But if you're selling to uh, consumers that, you know, consumers don't really have tolerance issues, they just like it or they don't like it, or they think it's good or that's bad. And therefore, the part of part of this problem really has to do with um, uh, what else, what are the standards by which you should be communicating? And I don't think we, I don't think a lot of, a lot of companies know. And the data that's required to do it sometimes is complica complicated to understand. <clears throat> well, and I agree with you. I think, you know, having, having uh, worked with Frontline and helping them understand uh, what the company was trying to do now for the past 30 years, you know, my, my experience has been that there is not often a malicious attempt to keep information from them. But I have found that there is, uh, frequently they don't get the information they need, need because either they don't have a mechanism for it. As you said, Ron, you know, communication isn't just about talking, it's about having a system that regularly transmits information to where it needs to be. And, you know, whether that's with a, uh, an email or a personal conversation or some kind of another system that works, you know, it frequently ends up that they don't know uh, what is expected of them. And if they do, they sometimes have either the wrong impression or the wrong information. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's all true, and so I'm sure we're all three of us are a little concerned just about the information and you know and whether whether or not people know how to do it and, and gather it and and small companies are really really vulnerable because they don't they don't get it. We've talked about the basic information a bunch of times, you know, having having financial um, uh, having bookkeeping systems that will gather the information at the right level and maintaining those, and then of course going through many many of the reports are really pretty good in terms of <clears throat> typical typical financial statement analysis uh, and even looking at some customer growth issues and so there's a lot of stuff in today's applications that can be utilized but then there's a whole nother level of stuff uh, data that is very very difficult to deal sort of the new big data analysis uh, that is is really changing things in a, in a way that I'm not sure we really quite understand. Um, 
uh, for the, for the, there won't be very many people uh, as a whole who will see this new movie movie by Dinesh D'Souza called Two Thousand Mules, uh, and it has it happens to be a particular work on the on the the election. Um, however, the the data part of of what he shows there is really eye opening, and any business person should understand the level of data that is now available. So you have to consider who your competition and how much data do they have. So in this particular example, they were the big these new big data guys were able to get oh, something like a trillion records of where people were by using their cell phones, and they tracked. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people based, and then they eliminated them based on the locations that they went, and if they went to certain locations over X number of times. And therefore, they were able to get these uh, thousands or millions of individual people narrowed down to a small group of folks who were interested in being at a certain place a certain number of times, uh, and they got down to 200 people. Well, now, if those happen to be your customers, you need to know who those 200 people are. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, otherwise, I, you're going to be marketing to 2 million people. So yeah, I, I, someone I think, who has that kind of knowledge is going to kill you if you don't have it. I agree with you in terms of, you know, that, that mega data analysis, you know, uh, the age of AI is going to have a huge bearing on that. I think from my experience, you know, how how the front line sees that and you know what that does to them is a very different matter you know that sure. mega data stuff doesn't mean anything to them what sure. means something to them is as this questions ask is that how do i do my work you know am i getting the information i need and my experience on that has been it's it's again not as much malicious as it is not understanding what they need or not finding the time or the system to be able to deliver it you know and that's that's always been in my mind an issue is that how do we create a system by which the frontline actually gets access to the information where they know that, hey, this is how this is impacting our customers and what can we do to improve it? And you know, one of the things I've enjoyed about Ed's mantra over the years we've worked together is that continuous improvement is something you need to continue to work on. And my best clients have had daily meetings in which they'd simply sit down and say, okay, this is what we have to produce today. And this is in manufacturing, I need to be specific about that, but it applies to service or whatever in which they would sit down and say, here's the beginning of the day. These are the things we need. Is there anything that's missing? Are there any orders that are late? Is there anything that we can shift around? Because basically, if you're expecting a shipment of uh, parts, as an example, for uh, manufacturing, and they haven't arrived today, you either have people standing around or you shift the workload so you say you can move to something else. And when they did those daily meetings, uh, invariably, their results improved. They got better results. And they kept people engaged because on a daily basis, they knew exactly where they were going and what they had to do to get things done for that day. Yeah, I, I think the, um, the importance of meetings are many times is understated in mo and small privately held companies. They think it's a lot of times they think it's a waste of time mm -hmm. or they don't want to share the information with people below them. And I really don't understand why. And, uh, I think the first step is to have a monthly meeting going over your PL and balance sheets and your cash flow. I think that's really important for people. And I think when you do it for the first time, you find out how much information people don't know about the company. Yeah. Uh, well, and, but the, the question then is who do you share that with? You yeah. talking about frontline workers? Well, no. I, I'd like to make an observation there before you go forward, Ed. You know, that's always been an issue. You know, companies said, well, I, do I want to share the dollars? And I said, well, look, take out the dollars, make it percentages. Yeah. You know, they, they can deal with these things. Yeah. And you don't have to make it dollars. They can say, hey, you know, 20% of our money is being spent in this area, which doesn't produce any benefit for the customer. Yeah, good and point. The frontline goes, whoa, that's, yeah. that's a lot of money. I think the monthly meeting I'm talking about is with the management teams. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not talking about the uh, frontline employees. I, I think for frontline employees, you need daily meetings for what 10 10 minutes 15 minutes at the moment yeah. get everybody on the same page everybody aligned but i think uh when you look at a management team and including the ownership going through those numbers and understanding what's impacting those numbers and then projecting numbers out into the future 
is a big step forward for a lot of them. And um, it's very basic, but they're just not used to doing it. They've never done it before. Right, right. And they, and they think they know, understand all these numbers. And uh, they, they uh, many times they don't. Yeah. But, yeah, and that's, that is clearly sort of like number one on the list uh, that, that that information has got to be disseminated to the right people and in a timely basis. It actually keeps the sort of management uh, owners honest in the sense that they've got to they've got to perform as well and bring that information back to everybody so they can perform. You know the idea of uh, oh say condemning somebody's work without the real facts is kind of a stupid and poor you know speaking that's, that's no, you know management I mean that's kind of a, a stupid way to discipline people yes. and that doesn't really work. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I, I would say those are all true. I'm, yeah, I think I'm sort of, I'm sort of uh, uh, also, you know, after you go through that point, um, trying to make a second point, and that is that you have to know what it is you need to improve in order to spend the money improving it. Well, that gets into my second point, yeah. these uh, weekly or daily meetings going over the analytical aspects of the company like you and i have just recently done ron um it's pretty when you start looking at uh, the number of units produced every week and you look at how the productivity by machine and you look at the orders that are uh that are in the queue and you, you look at how much uh, inventory is on the floor if you're analyzing that information it's going to tell you a story and eventually it's going to show you where your opportunities are to improve the business. Right. And it also helps you understand the orders coming in and how well you're doing and meeting the expectations of your customers. So that's more of a kind of a production oriented meeting. Um, but I think you kind of need both. And, and eventually you need to pair the two so that you understand how the operational yeah. stuff impacts the numbers in the PL. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree. Again, um, I, I'll, the, the issue there is, is that when you look at your own numbers only, you have to be awfully careful uh, that you don't miss something from the outside. Um, one of my mentors used to say, pay attention to your business and, and uh, pay, let's say, oh, I've, I've forgotten it. Uh, mind, it, mind your own business and mind it well. In other words, stop worrying about everybody else, but make sure you know what your business is doing. Right. And I think, and, you know, and I think that's that's good. But I'm going to I'll give you an example, which I've been thinking about for the last week or two or three weeks. I've been buying, as, as I mentioned, a lot of stuff for for my for my home recently, uh, having to do with security and lighting and things like that. And, you know, up, upgrading old systems to new systems. I am really, really shocked at how uniform and high quality many of these things are. They're really great. If only I could understand how to run them. But then here we have a situation where you're buying a uh, $140, say, item. I'm working on a new automated sprinkler system. And what comes with that $140 item? A little teeny card that is literally in four point type that you undo as if you had a magnifying glass to read it. And then everything is simple and not detailed. And if there isn't some issue like the light is supposed to be flashing and not constant or vice versa, they don't tell you that. There's no place to um, fix that problem if you go on to say use their qr code and you do that and you look at there's still no way to get so what i'm saying is is that the product is really good and if you're focused on the product these people are going well our product is really really fabulous but what they forget is nobody nobody's satisfied because it's even though it's a simple process it's not a complete explanation of the process and the cost to develop that might be one penny to make it bigger and better across those units, but they're not doing that part of it. This partially has to do with big data, this knowledge management, the third step in what we're talking about. And that is there's a lot of data out there 
who in a company or even in an industry is paying attention to these trends to be able to say, if you'd like to improve your customer experience, do something as simple as provide real directions written by real English people who, can, who, who know the language well uh, and can properly explain things to people with you know images that work and in a type size that the buyer, an old person can actually read. I mean, these things are so easily understood. And we're falling back into customers. Probably the last section, I don't want to do that. I'm talking about the data that you that is available in order to be able to analyze the things that a company needs to improve. I don't expect people to get much past number one or number two from each of you who have brought forward. I, but I'm, I'm wanting smaller businesses who are listening to us to recognize they be, need to begin to think about these things. Because just like if you ignored the internet, you'll be out of business. Uh, if you ignore big data in the future, you'll be out of business, except you just won't know why. Well, well I, we just, uh, you and I, Ron, you and I experienced a situation this week where someone gave an analytical report that brought a lot of things to issue. Mm -hmm. And um, by using data that's available uh, in the company and uh, without those observations, we would be working in the dark. We wouldn't have a clue what was going on mm -hmm. behind the scenes. And um, that's, that's where the analytical part comes in. And this, this, question, this series of questions really doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't address the analytical part. And the analytical part drives knowledge and it really improves the way you operate a company. Yeah, that's worthy. Just talking more about that is probably worthy of a, of a program by itself. Well, here's the problem I also have, and here's the challenge I have with uh, the whole program. And that is you're, most people are going to go through these five questions here and they're going to say, oh, yeah, we're doing a great job. Because a lot of times and they're answering it uh, honestly, because in their opinion, they are doing a great job. But what are they comparing it to? Right. Um, and there's nobody from the outside pushing them to really dive deep into these questions as to what they're really trying to get at. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why uh, there, there's got to be someone from the outside that really is involved helping uh, administer these these questions in an organization. Yeah, this is clearly a really good place to hire. Uh, to tire outside people to help if you could if, it's difficult to find the right ones for your industry, but it's a it's a good place to, to hire folks who can add to that whole dimension. Right and, and this, uh, you know, this is a um, obviously designed to be a very cursory overview of the of all yeah. this. it's not, you know, if you if you do the Baldridge, I can guarantee you, you're going to have to have measurable data on each of these points before you get any points for it, you know, so that's, that's a distinction. The other thing I wanted to bring up that I think is really important from our conversation in terms of small businesses and how they view this idea of having daily meetings and stuff. I can't tell you the number of times I've had companies say, we don't have time for that, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but, but as we've all experienced when, the, when a bad product goes out to the customer, boy, we sure do find time to figure out how to fix it. And then it's too late. Yeah. Because the customer's already made a decision, I'm not going to work with you anymore, you know. And, and, um, and it took 10 times the time as the meeting. You know, exactly. It's just like it's, it's, it's a bizarre thing, but it's, it's a function of, as we've said before, Ron, you know, small business owners tend to be pretty independent minded. They think they know everything that has to be done. And some of that is wise and some of that's right. But many times I know their front line doesn't feel like it's their place to tell them. I can't tell you the number of times I've had people tell me on the front line, well, yeah, I know this, this has been a problem for years, but I can't do anything about it. And I'm certainly not going to bring it up and lose my job. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of the, the confusion is, has to do with not holding a productive meeting. I think uh, when, when you have a meeting like this, you have to have put the badges at the door and everybody has an equal opportunity to speak. And the other thing is it isn't an opportunity for, um, people that talk about their weekend and what or what they're going to do this weekend. Yeah, they got to say they got to stay focused on what they're there for and get the heck out and, and go out and do their jobs. And unfortunately, meetings aren't held that way a lot of times. And then there's no notes, so there's no accountability 
for the next meeting. So you're rehashing the same stuff you right. talked about in the first meeting. So you, you got to have some structure to your meeting and you have, and it has to be productive. Yeah. Yes. And, and my experience has been when it's done that way, you know, uh, one of my uh, best client relationships, you know, they had every minute, every day, it was 15 minutes before the uh, company started and they had, they actually broke it into pieces. You know, there was, okay, let's, what's going on in production today? What needs to be done? What doesn't need to be done? And they had a small five minute section every day on a cultural element. You know, this is, you know, we're reading this book today. We're trying to help develop people's understanding of what is leadership? What is business? And, you know, the function of that was that a lot of these people who are frontline workers are not stupid. They just are ignorant. And I don't mean that in a negative sense is that they've never been taught. And, you know, when you start opening them up to what it is, you know, first of all, they feel like they're a part of things. And then secondly, they start applying that stuff and it starts growing them personally. And then they start growing your business from the inside out. Absolutely. And it's not, and the other thing is, and I've learned this from Ron, um, is that it's not what you think you should do. It's what the data tells you to do. And I think that's a big distinction. I, I've seen uh, owners come in and say, we're going to buy this machine. Um, we're going to buy it today. Well, it doesn't fit any of the existing customers. There's uh, no uh, financial justification for it. And um, probably be a waste of money if you bought that machine without some analysis. You got you to gotta analyze things and determine how it's going to impact the future. And yep. if it's not going to generate positive cash flows, you wouldn't want to buy it. Yeah. That's well, right. I know I've, uh, you've been saying that for years. And I think, I think it's, it's, again, it's a function of how do we shift the mind of the owner? Because, you know, as we do these things, you know, the, the front line will never look at this. You know, what we're really trying to do is shift the thinking of people who are the, the, the cornerstone of the American economy. You know, people who realize, wow, yeah, maybe this meeting is not so much uh, a waste of time as it is an opportunity for us to really use these tools to be able to better understand how we can improve the company and let our team help us with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, the, you know, the sooner that the uh, owner stops acting like the king yeah. uh, and begins acting more like um, a group leader, and I'm not sure how to explain that. But in other words, you, you can't know that you know everything. And if you do, you'll eventually find out you did not know everything. Yeah. Um, some of us some of us have had our uh, uh, had our hair cut a little bit because we thought we could do anything we wanted to. And what we did, you know, our decisions had been basically right. But, you know, there, none of us gets everything right all of the time. We're going to make a certain percentage of mistakes. And sometimes listening more carefully to other people inside and outside, uh, you, you don't you don't have to make the decision to do these things, but you sure ought to listen to all the smart ideas that are out there. No, and I think one of the things I've said in the past is that uh, American small business is the last bastion of the medieval fiefdom. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, he's the Lord, I am the serf, I don't say anything, I just let him do what he wants. And as you pointed out, that can, will not change, Ron, unless you give people permission to make that change. Yeah, no, I, I, have to come I think and say, right now... There are a lot of smaller. There are a lot of smaller companies, I think, that are attempting to to make that shift. Uh, younger younger people um, who kind of see this as more of a group activity and not, you know, I invested the money, I'm the owner, I get to say. Um, I do think that there is some shift there. Um, it'll be interesting to watch and see if these companies can be successful. Um, you know that from that perspective. And I, but I think the ones that do are typically the, the tech companies where you're hiring people in the top uh, five or 10% of the IQ range. Right. And uh, when you have uh, 80 or 90% of your people who are at that, at that level of uh, intellect, sort of mental intellect, you are going to get a lot of good information and you can allow things to, to be a little bit different than if you've got folks from the bottom 10% of the intellect and you have to be very, very careful uh, to even communicate properly with them. 
Um, and again, now that's going back to people. We're going to talk about work, workforce here next week. But if you don't understand where your people are, how do you know what to tell them? And that's a big, big deal. Well, I think, you know, if I can draw a parallel between what we're talking about and good teaching, you know, and I, I'm going to reflect on, I know, uh, you know, Ed, your wife was a teacher and my wife's a teacher and, you know, and, and we've, we've experienced good teachers and bad teachers. Um, and the good teachers are able to engage the students and make them feel important. And the bad ones just say, you know, sit down, don't do anything. I'll tell you when to think. And if I need you to think, I'll squeeze your head. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very uh, true. And, right? and too many times, I think that I see small businesses, you know, it's, it kind of come from that mindset. And yet the good ones and the ones you're talking about, the ones I've seen, you know, understand that, gee, this is a group effort. The more the more input we get from these people, the better we're going to be. You know, it's so anyway, that's just an observation. Well, I, have, I have to say one thing related to that. Yesterday, I went to a baseball game where my grandson's playing and one of the coaches uh, came out to his own kid and said, you really disappointed me today. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine that? I mean, those were the words. What do yeah. you think it did to that kid? Yeah. And the oh, same absolutely. thing applies in business. It does happen. Oh, yeah. And, and if you don't allow people to speak, uh, that's one thing. If you allow people to speak and then you tear them down, that's another thing. But I always thought that if you let people talk, you find out not all you allow them the opportunity to be engaged. And that's a good thing. But you also can find out as an owner which ones are really carrying water and which ones are not. Right. You'll find out pretty quickly which your which of your employees are really have that ability to make positive change and which ones are just going through the motions. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I think what you're saying is that you know you you really figure out who's who's able to stay and, and they'll give you that information. You'll know and you can then let people go who are not a good fit for your organization. Absolutely. That, yeah, that's, that's part of the key is that you do, you do have to understand you're going to make <clears throat> hires that uh, don't work. Uh, and, and, and I'll, I'll just, just to be sort of counter for a second, um, I think that being told that the, 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 the dis, there's disappointment there, while that could have been a whole lot better done i absolutely agree i think it is less less hurtful in the long run in someone's life than giving everybody on the team a participation uh, award because what that means is those of you who did really well and we might you know your dad might have said he did really well he might have also said you could have done better but if you get a participation award and you and you didn't do anything and nobody said gee good job and you still get that. Well, that's word. that's yeah. a good point because if if you don't let your your people speak up, you really don't know which ones are doing yeah. a good job. Right. Sometimes yeah. you're gonna get you're gonna give uh, uh, yeah. compliments to everybody, and not everybody deserves them. Yeah. So, so I mean, I baseball think. baseball is a pretty good example because you know uh, you keep track of all of the errors and et cetera. And so you know, how many balls did you catch, and how many how many throws did you miss, how many times were you bat? Um, how many strikes did you get? Those are all very definitive things. And if you know that your son uh, or daughter is uh, performing at a certain level and then they have a bad day, it's sort of like, well, you don't have to say you disappointed me. Um, you, you, but you, you might want to say you, you're a little bit under your capability today. But the one you really want to say you're disappointed is when somebody doesn't try. Right. Now, I can tell you for sure, uh, and uh, although my dad never told me this directly, but when I was standing out in left field as a very young child playing playing baseball with my glove over my face, looking at the stars, yeah, uh, or maybe the picking flowers, and the ball came and just went straight past me. You know what? I deserved to have my ass kicked, and if I had been told I, you know, I disappointed him. It wouldn't have been because I didn't catch the ball right. It's because I was not paying attention and did not care. Okay. Right, right. Well, yeah, throw one I, didn't, more thing I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have been on that field. You see. Yeah. Let me uh, throw one other thing in, and that is training. So uh, you know, yes. you tell the kids, okay, you have to get in front of the ball. Baseball is a good, good thing to uh, look at. Right, right. And 
Um, and then you keep hitting balls 100 miles an hour at them, and then you get disappointed, <laughs> and you start yelling yeah. and screaming. They never ever better off. Uh, it, I told him, this is what I've been working with my son on. You take your son out, and you hit him some balls. You, you're training. You're, you're, yep. you're trying to retrain him right. offside, the outside of that field. Then when he right. goes to the field, he's got one thing the next time he goes and that's confidence yeah right if right. you don't have confidence you have nothing in baseball well, well and i yeah, think that's I right think, i think the point you're making here ed and it's it's such a, a neat analogy to what we're discussing in terms of business is that when you develop people's confidence their dignity and their respect they'll work harder for you than than if you do the other thing you know and so the point is that even with the leaders it's a matter of training them how to communicate in order to get the most out of their team. Some yeah. people will listen. Others will just say, screw you, I'm going to do it my way. But the ones who listen are the ones that ultimately, as you said, Ron, are the ones who are creating the, the big companies <laughs> because they understand it's a team effort. And, and again, you, you know, making a comment like you disappointed me is not quantifiable. See, that, that, that's not communication that is useful. Right. In order for someone to understand what they didn't do, you have to say, you know, we expected uh, our normal expectation is 3000 uh, widgets today. You did 2500. I mean, that's a little disappointing. What can we do to help you get that back? Right, up? right. Or in, in, the, in the case of the example you used, now, Ron, we appreciate you're looking at the stars, but we're in the middle of a baseball game. And it would be helpful if you took the glove off your face and look for the ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you could do that the first time, but what do you say the third time? That's, that's, see, there's the problem. It's the right, third right. time. You know, I mean, then it's something like, you know, it's, it's obvious that you really don't have your heart in the game, but, you know, did you really want to play this? Yeah, yeah. 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 No, no. You know, yeah. you made me, you made me do this because you thought he'd turn me into a man or something like that. Well, you know, I, I can give you a, a perfect example from my son, Kyle, who's six foot nine. And from the time he was in the second grade, I had him in basketball because it was my hope that he would, you know, learn enough and play enough so he could get a scholarship in college. Yeah. And, you know, in the 11th grade, he came in to me and he said, Dad, I, I just don't want to do this anymore. You know, and, yeah. and he said, you know, I'd, I'd really like to be an actor. Um, and, you know, I had to, I had to come to grips with this is, this was his dream, not, not the old man's dream, you know, and, right. and sometimes I think that is one of the things we do to young people, whether it's our family or it's a business person who we make assumptions about where they want to go, as opposed to, like you said, Ed, asking them, <laughs> yeah. where would you like to go here? Is yeah. this a good fit for you? Would that it be better to, for you to find your future elsewhere? That kind of gets, you, yeah. gets to the point where you want to get the right, the right people in the right seats of the bus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, and getting the right people do, uh, doing the right things, too. Uh, yeah, yeah. A similar story, you know, when I was growing up, my dad, my dad was a wonderful musician, and uh, he played the clarinet, had his own dance band, um, and uh, he, he thought that, you know, that would be something good for me to do. And I absolutely hated it. And so we got to the point to happen to be eighth grade, got to the point to where it's like, you know, if you, uh, what you're going to be going to be out on the football uh, is, you know, field doing halftime. And I basically went to my dad and I said, dad, I don't want to be playing music on the football field. I want to be bashing heads. I want right. to play the game. I don't want to watch the game. Right. And uh, that's when he finally allowed me to quit and go out for football. And of course, I, I had a, a, a wonderful uh, five or six years playing football. <clears throat> and that's because I that's, that's what I loved. That's right. that gave me meaning playing another instrument gave me no meaning at all. Yeah, yeah. And, and I had somewhat the same experience, you know, my dad was really didn't think that sports were meaningful in any way, shape or form. And it, 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 it made my heart sing in my mind uh go i mean i just love basketball i love track i love cross country you know it was the yeah. usual things that really in my mind made a difference you know mm -hmm. um so you know the the real challenge as we talk about our personal experience is that even in business as ed had pointed out the more you engage people the more you realize where they fit and where they don't and and it becomes easier than to ed's point to be able to say to somebody you know i think it 
And I think you need to look elsewhere for work, not because we don't love you, we don't care about you, but this is not a good fit for you. Right. You need to go someplace you know, where you'll be successful and you'll uh, enjoy. Yes, it. yes. Where you're going to be who yeah. you were designed to be. That's right. That is right. It's amazing. This one little subject generated so much conversation because it's a very powerful uh, part of the Baldridge analysis. Mm -hmm. right. So uh, it was a very good session, and I appreciate everybody for your thoughts on this matter. Well, thank you very much. So let's wrap it up, and uh, next week we'll start talking about workforce. Sounds good. See you then. Bye-bye. Thank you.